Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Photoshop Bootcamp. My name is Howard Pinsky, design evangelist here at Adobe. I hope you're all doing well on this Tuesday morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever it is in the world you are. If you are tuning live here on Behance, let me know in the chat who you are and where you're tuning in from. Hey, Wade and Clever, great to see you. Bootcamp, day number two. Yesterday, we kicked things off exploring how to download the Photoshop application, exploring a little bit about the Creative Cloud desktop application, and we dove into Photoshop for the very first time, explored the UI, customized the UI, which is always exciting, then explored some basic workflows, photo editing using adjustment layers, layers, we use uh, selections, all sorts of fun things, and today we're gonna ramp things up even more, and we're gonna be designing a magazine cover. And we're gonna be diving deep into selections, more layers, we're gonna be looking at masks, all sorts of fun things. Blend modes, possibly, who knows? And as a reminder, if anyone has questions throughout this bootcamp, definitely throw them in the chat. I will be taking a peek from time to time. We've got uh, Clever from uh, Texas and Clarissa and Patrick. Great to see you all. All right, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna hop over to my screen. Boop, there we go. And we're gonna get going. So, like I mentioned, we're going to be designing a magazine cover today using all sorts of techniques. And this is the starter file that you are able to download in the description of this live stream or the video if you're watching this later. We have a few things to take note. We have a bunch of artboards, but we're gonna be actually creating, if you feel comfortable, we're gonna be creating a new document so I can show you that process. Or if you wanna work on this particular uh, file here, you're more than welcome. So we have some of the fonts that are used and I'm gonna show you how to get some of these fonts. If you have a Creative Cloud plan, these fonts should sync on over as you open up this document. But if not, you can definitely use some typefaces that are on your computer locally, or I'm gonna show you in just a moment how you can get some additional ones. So here are some of the typefaces that we're gonna be using. I will mention that typically you don't use this many in, in a single print project, but we're gonna have some fun. We're gonna mix things up a little bit. And then down here at the bottom, we have some assets we're gonna be using. Mainly, we're gonna be using two assets. We're gonna be using this athlete over here on the left and an effect for the background over here on the right. Now, you might be asking, where do you get all these things, right? Where do you get these typefaces? Where do you get these images that you're using throughout this project? Well, one thing I would love to do, speaking of love, Sean just says, loving lust right now. It's a fun typeface, isn't it? This one right over here. They have Lust Display, they have Lust Regular, all sorts of fun stuff. It's pretty cool. So if I hop over to Finder, sorry, uh, Safari, that's the one. I'm gonna start at Adobe Stock. Now this is a great place to look if you need some assets for a project like this, this, especially if you're designing for a portfolio, right? You wanna create something really striking and something that's gonna catch people's eye. And Adobe Stock is a great place to start. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, I just don't have the budget to pay for credits and things like that. And that's totally fine because all the assets that I use in this bootcamp are from the free version of Adobe Stock, the free library. It's signing in. Come on, you can do it, there we go. So in the free section, we have free photos, free vectors, free videos, all sorts of fun stuff. And if you search for something like athlete, right? Athlete, there we go, if I can spell properly, we have 12,180 assets that you can download completely for free to use in your projects, which is incredible. And somewhere in this list is the asset that I'm using. But all of these, even though they're free to use, all of them are very striking images and they should work great for your projects, right? And then on the font side, if you go to fonts.adobe.com, Wade's gonna pop that link in the chat in just a moment. Go to all fonts, it's gonna sign in again. I think I signed out before I restarted or started this stream. And then on the left-hand side, you can really narrow down what exact typeface you're looking for. So if you want something 
a little bit more luxurious. You can go to luxury. And if you know exactly kind of what you're looking, what you're gonna be typing, you can type out something like sports, right? And then you can really get a preview of what that's gonna look like once you start implementing it on your actual project, which is really cool. So we're gonna be using some of these typefaces and some of these stock assets today, tomorrow, and the next day as well. All right. Let's go ahead and pop back over to Photoshop. And like I mentioned, we're gonna be starting a new document for this particular project. So I'm gonna go ahead and press Command and Control N or under the file menu and then down to new. And there's a lot going on here. Now, don't feel too intimidated because the majority of the time, you're gonna choose one of these templates or one of these presets that you've already created, or you're gonna hop right over here to the right-hand side and you're gonna enter in some values that you might wanna start with, right? You can also go to the top and you have some presets there. So if you know you're gonna be designing something for print, you can hop into this section and you have some very basic and common presets letter, legal, tabloid, A4. You can view all, you can view more down here. And we also have some templates down here at the bottom and we have flyers and billboards, all sorts of fun stuff that will give you a nice head start. But again, if you do wanna just dive in and add some values right over here to the right, you can certainly do that. Now, you may have noticed, if I go back to recent and I go back to print, something has changed. Actually, a few things have changed, right? Photoshop knows that typically when you are designing for print, you're gonna to wanna to design in inches. So it changed it automatically to inches, where if I go back to recent, my recent document was in pixels, right? And if I go to web, it's gonna also be in pixels because that's typically what you're designing for, right? And also the resolution change. I talked a little bit about this yesterday. The resolution, some people have questions of what that is exactly, right? If you go to web, you see 72. If you go to resolution, or you go to print, you see 300. When you're printing something, you want as many pixels per inch as possible on your page. Now, of course, you don't want to go to like a thousand. That would be a little bit ridiculous. But somewhere between you know two and three hundred is pretty decent for print. For web, seventy-two is usually pretty good. Now, we are going to be designing for print, so I'm going to be starting with eight point five by eleven, and the resolution we're going to set to three hundred. Now, you have to keep in mind that when you have a larger resolution, your document's going to be larger, right? So if I go ahead and press create. It's gonna create our document and there it is now, right? And it, right now it's at 33% uh, zoom level, right? So if I go to 100%, it zooms in pretty hard, right? But we have our document and we're gonna start designing. Now, the first thing I might wanna do is I want, might wanna set the stage. Now I know that I want a darker background on this particular magazine cover, right? So there's a few ways we can do that. I'm gonna start by unlocking the background. In this case, it's probably not necessary, I just like unlocking the background. That way I have a little bit more flexibility. I can move it if I need to, all this fun stuff. Now, what I might want is a gradient on the background itself. Now, there are a few ways we can do that. The first way is over here on the left-hand side in our tools bar, we can grab the gradient tool. Now, you might not see it at first. And I talked a little bit about this yesterday. Some of the tools on the left in the tools bar actually have hidden and common tools alongside with them. So the move tool, for example, if I hold down my mouse, we have the move tool and the artboard tool. And you might see the paint bucket tool on the left initially, right? But if you hold down your mouse, you will see the gradient tool. Now, over on the right in this little flyout, you'll see a letter. And that corresponds to the keyboard shortcut that will activate the gradient. And what's kind of cool is if you have the paint bucket active, or if you have nothing active, let's say the move tool, and you press G, it's going to initially select the paint bucket or whatever the last tool in that group was. However, if you hold down your shift key and you click your press your G again, it's going to cycle through those tools, which is really cool. So if you don't want to move your mouse over to the side or you have your tools hidden or whatever that might be, um, you can do that. Someone, Carol's asking your ruler isn't in inches. It isn't because I overrode that earlier, but if you right click, boop, you can choose inches. That's a good call out, which is definitely gonna help in print. And I was gonna get to rulers in just a moment because I'm not gonna dive too deep into like bleeds and things like that. But when you're designing for print, you typically wanna make sure that there's a little bit of a border around your document so that, you know, when it's printed, Usually, you know, there's a little bit of a bleed and things get cut off on the sides and the tops. You want to make sure you don't put any of the content 
too far into that area because it might get lost, right? But for rulers, if you don't see your rulers, Command and Control R will show your rulers or hide them. And you can just very easily drag some out just like that. And as you're dragging out, you're going to notice contextually it's showing exactly how far it is from the sides, right? Which is great. And I can also drag one out from the top. But if you do know that you have specific values under the view menu, I always get this wrong, under the view menu, you can go down to guides and then new guide or new guide layout. All sorts of things that you can do, but you can do new guide and let's say you wanted maybe 0.5 inches. So I can do 0.5 vertical in this case, press OK. And there we go, which is wonderful. So you can go ahead and really customize the guides to your liking. And in your preferences, you can also change the color of your guides as well. But back to the gradient. So we want a gradient, right? And I might want in the center, knowing that there's going to be an athlete right in the center as well. I might want a little bit of a lighter area right in the middle. And then it kind of fades out to a darker area. So right here at the top, we can control our gradient. Now, before I dive into that, we can click on this arrow and we can see some basic presets, right? So if you wanted some blues, for example, or purples or pinks or grays or all sorts of different things, or just basic, right? Now, in this case, I had my last gradient was color, which basically the foreground color to transparent, right? But I want two different colors. So I'm going to choose this one, foreground to background. And it's going to use these colors down here at the bottom, which by the way, you can press the X key on your keyboard to swap between foreground and background, which is kind of fun, right? So maybe in the center, we're going to go ahead and choose maybe a something to this effect, a little bit lighter. And then on the side, I can actually sample this color and I'm going to darken it. We don't want our gradients to be too drastic because then we're going to have some dithering going on. We're going to have, you know, some banding, I should say, and we're going to have all sorts of weird looking effects, right? Press OK. And I know someone's going to mention CMYK and RGB and things like that. That's for another day. But if you're designing for print, CMYK is probably the way to go. Now, so I have my color set, but if I were to drag out a gradient from, let's say, top to bottom, I can hold down my shift key, shift key to constrain it. It looks all right, but what I might want is more of a radial gradient, right? So up here at the top, we have our different options. We have our linear gradient, we have our radial, we have our angle, reflected, and diamond. You can also choose to reverse, dither, transparency, all that fun stuff. So if I choose radial, and start somewhere in the middle and draw out, now have a radial gradient, right? And again, like I mentioned, it's exactly what I want. It's a little bit more of a, a lighter area in the center and it kind of fades out to a darker area. Now, how else do, can you create a gradient? One more area you can create a gradient is with a layer style. So if I double click on this layer here, it's gonna open up our layer styles and I can go to a gradient overlay. And this gives you a little bit more control over your gradient because it's always gonna be there. You can always double click to go back and make some changes. So I can go to radial, for example, I have the same thing, but I can also control the angle, right? I can scale it a little bit if I wanted to, or I can dive in here and make some changes. So maybe I want not so much of a vibrant gradient. I can pull that back a little bit. Maybe this one, I want a little bit darker. And there we go. We have our gradient. And like I mentioned, we can always dive back because it pops it right below the layer. I can always double click and go back to my gradient and make some changes. All right. So we have our gradient in place and it looks okay, but we might want a little bit of an effect back there to kind of make it look a little bit more mysterious. And that's kind of where images can come into play alongside blend modes. Now, if you're working on this document here, you can just grab this image and drag it on over to your artboard. Or if you're working on a separate document, you can grab this image, copy it, and then paste it over here. Or if you have your images in Finder, like I do right over here, I have this image from Adobe Stock, drag it on in and boop, pop it in place. Now I can hold down my Alt key and Shift key to constrain it from the center and drag it on up just like that. And I'm holding down my shift key, my spacebar key and my alter option key and just moving scrubbing like this to zoom in and out, right? So we have our new image in place and it comes in as a smart object, which is wonderful, but it's kind of covering up that gradient. And this is where blend modes come into play. We want this smoke to be here, 
but we want it to be very subtle, right? So if I hop over here to the right inside of my layers panel, or if you moved it over to the left, like I showed you yesterday, it'll be over there. But I can open up this section here, and this is our blend modes. Right now it's set to normal, which is gonna display this image as it is, right? But I can move my mouse down just like this, and it's going to affect the layer. It's gonna blend it with the background. Now, this first section is really focusing on the darker tones, but we want in this section here to focus on the lighter tones. And you can notice as I move my mouse, you're gonna see different effects, right? Screen is pretty nice. It's gonna kind of knock out some of the darker tones from this particular image, leaving us with just the smoke, which is kind of fun. Color Dodge will do a very similar effect. Now, a lot of this is very mathematical, so I'm not gonna to dive too deep into to blend mode. Some of it I don't completely understand, to be honest. But something like Screen or Color Dodge should look pretty well. You can also you know, drop the opacity if you don't want as strong of an effect. But I think this looks kind of neat. This section at the bottom is going to eventually be covered up by that athlete in just a moment. So not too worried about that. So we have our background. And what we can do to keep things organized is inside of the layers panel, we can group our um, carol saying or use the arrows up and down indeed. There's also a shortcut aside from the arrows to cycle between the different blend modes. It escaped my mind, but someone in the chat will definitely let me know. So in the layers panel, I might wanna group these two layers together. So what I'm gonna do is with one of them selected, I'm gonna hold down my shift key on my keyboard and click on the second one. And then I can create a group either by clicking on this icon right here at the bottom, which says create new group or command or control G. And I can go ahead and name this double, by double clicking background. Beautiful. All right, so we have our background in place, and now we need our main subject, which is our athlete. Again, if you're working on your sample file, you can definitely work on the athlete here, or you can drag it onto here. Or there's so many different ways to do things in Photoshop, right? If I hop back over to Finder, I have some athletes over here inside of this folder, and here's the athlete that we're gonna be using. So we can either drag the athlete directly onto this document here and resize them up and pop them in place somewhere right about there. Maybe I'll resize a little bit further down just so his arms are perfectly centered. There we go. Press enter or return. Or what you can do is you can open it separately in Photoshop, work on it there, and then bring it over. So a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, there's no really right or wrong way. A lot of it comes down to personal preference, right? So what we wanna do now is we want to extract this subject from the background. Now, if we were to go to the blend modes, which some of you might be, oh, this is a black background, it'll knock it out pretty easily. Not necessarily. It does an okay job, but it also kind of knocks out some of his shorts, which are a darker color as well. Some of the shirt, which isn't you know a pure black either, right? So blend modes, it'll give you interesting effects. I would definitely encourage you, like that's an interesting effect, right? I don't hate that, but I want to make sure I want a nice, clean cutout from the subject, right? All right, so what we're gonna do is, we wanna do a few things. We might want to, if you're noticing on the in the properties panel, we cannot see the option to remove the background. And that's because when we brought this image in, it brought it in as a smart object. And we talked a little bit about smart objects yesterday. So if we wanted to make that edit, we can either double click on this smart object, pop it open here, unlock the background, and then remove the background here. Or what we can do, let me not save this, we can rasterize. We can convert it to layers right over here, or we can rasterize it, all sorts of fun stuff. And that will give us a rasterized image. Pros and cons, right, of using smart objects versus rasterized images. But now we have the option to remove the background automatically, or we can select the subject. And remove background has gotten so much better in the last few years. If I go ahead and click on that, you're gonna notice, bam, right? Now, of course, I'll admit, this is a pretty simple subject, right? He doesn't have any crazy hair with waves all over the place. It's pretty simple. So remove background is gonna do a really decent job. Another option is to select the subject, and this will give you a little bit more flexibility, right? And I should mention, there are a few ways to do this, right? If we go to our layers over here, we have our quick selection tool where we can increase our brush and paint over the subject like that, a little bit more flexibility. 
or we can go to our object selection tool. And we're gonna dive deeper into that, I think, tomorrow. But what it's doing is right here at the top, it's detecting the objects in this particular image. Not just one object, all the objects. Now this one only has one object, right? But I can go ahead and click on it, and it's going to select that object for me, which is wonderful. Now there is an option right in here. In, where is it? I know it's here somewhere. There it is. Under select subject, you can choose to select the subject on your device or use the cloud, right? And it's going to give you a little bit more detailed results if you use the cloud, but for the most part, device works pretty well. So let me go ahead and go back to select subject. And what you're gonna notice is when you have a subject selected and you have any of the selection methods active, you can dive into select and mask. And this is really going to allow you to really refine your selection, right? Again, the subject doesn't have any crazy or wavy hair or you know any elements that might require heavy selection refinement. We are definitely gonna to get to that tomorrow. But you can always dive in here, right? And down here at the bottom, you can shift the edge a little bit, move it on in, move it on out. I mentioned yesterday that if your subject is on, let's say a, a colorful background, like a green screen, for example, you can decontaminate the colors at the bottom. And it's gonna give you a much nicer selection, right? But this looks pretty good. I'm gonna pan through. Pants are looking pretty good. I'm gonna move it down a little bit, but it, you know what? I think it looks pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and output it. I can output it as a selection, or I can output it directly as a layer mask, which is exactly what we want, right? And there we go. Now, layer masks. If you're brand new to a layer mask, what is it? Well, essentially, on a very basic level, it uses white and black. White is visible, black and is hidden. And you can see that in action right here in the layers panel, right? We have our layer mask attached to the right-hand side, and everything that is currently visible on this layer is painted in white, and everything that is hidden is painted in black. And I use paint the word painted very deliberately, because one thing I love about layer masks is that you can paint to reveal or hide, right? So if I grab my brush tool, shortcut key B, I can right click to alter the brush. Maybe I'll make it a little bit lower. Maybe I'll bump up the hardness a little bit to about 80. And I can zoom on in, let's say I wanted, let's say for whatever reason, actually it looks like his ear may have gotten cut off a little bit. Now what you can do is you can hold down your shift key and click on the layer mask to see no layer mask, layer mask, right? So there's a little bit of a an issue with his ear right here, right? I'm also noticing right down here where his shirt is, there's a little bit hidden. It's not the worst thing in the world, but definitely the ear I wanna make, I wanna change. So with my brush, I'm going to make sure to brush with white. So right now, black is the foreground color. If I press the X key, view, it switches over and I can just paint on in, right? And his ear will come on back. And sometimes it's beneficial to overpaint. So you can see some of the original layer and then switch over to black. Again, shortcut key X and then paint on over. And if you're using something like a Wacom tablet, it just makes your life so much easier. I'm not at the moment. I'm using the good old mouse, but there we go. All right, that looks pretty good. Again, hold down shift and click. There's a little bit over here that I might wanna paint back in. And I can always bring down the hardness a touch, maybe to about, let's say 30%. and just paint that in a little bit. There we go. Oops. I had the layer mask disabled. Perfect. All right, so that's looking pretty good. Now, another thing we might wanna do for a subject like this, and this happens pretty often in the world of photo retouching, is you know dodging and burning. Now, if you're brand new to photo editing, those words probably mean absolutely nothing. But essentially, dodging, which I should po probably point out, are tools over here on the left-hand side. So dodging will really help enhance the highlights of your image. Burning will burn them, right? So it'll make them darker. So it'll make your areas lighter or darker. You also have the sponge tool, which affects saturation, but we're not gonna worry too much about that today. But if we go to our dodge tool, for example, what this will allow us to do, if I hop over to the actual layer and not the layer mask, 
is I can control the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. And again, I'm on the dodge tool, which is going to brighten up those areas. So if I wanted to brighten up the midtones, for example, I can just paint over top of it and it's going to brighten those areas up. Now, if Rick was here, I don't see Rick today, but if Rick was here, he'd be screaming at me that this is very destructive. And it absolutely is. Sometimes you might just want to work on a single layer and, you know, dodge and burn to your heart's content, right? And you can hold down your alter option key to actually switch in real time to dodge or burn, whichever the opposite, whatever you have, right? So I can burn or dodge like this, hold down alter option and burn, right? But again, this is very, very destructive. So what we're going to do is we're going to work on a new layer. We're going to dodge and burn on a new layer. So what I'm going to do is down here at the bottom of the layers panel, I'm going to press the create new layer button. And if I were to just simply start dodging and burning, nothing is going to happen, right? So what we want to do is this is a fun little non-destructive tip is we want to fill this entire layer with 50% gray. And you can do that but under the edit menu, go down to fill and right here under contents, 50% gray. Press OK. And then what you want to do is set the blend mode to screen. Sorry, not screen, soft light. And that's going to hide everything that is perfectly gray, 50% gray, right? And now what you're able to do is with the exact same burn and dodge tool, you can go ahead and start burning and dodging, right? Just like that. And all of this is now done on a separate layer. So you can hold down your Alt key, or option key to burn and let go to dodge, right? Let's give him a little bit of a highlight. Bump up his ears a little bit, right? Maybe burn around his nose a touch. Maybe brighten up his eyes a little bit. I can switch over to our shadows or midtones, our highlights, right? Now, what you might be noticing is as I'm painting in this area here, it's kind of affecting the background a little bit. And that's because the entire layer is 50% gray. So the burning and dodging is affecting everything, right? So what we can do is we can actually clip this layer to the layer below. And that can be done two ways. I zoom on in here. I can hold down my alter option key and hover in between the two layers. So I can go ahead and look for this little icon and click and that's going to clip it. Or I can right click and then create clipping mask. And that's gonna essentially take that top layer and stuff it into that bottom layer so that there's no overflow. General Kenobi is asking why if an image is larger than the workspace viewed at 100% and resized down, but still larger than the workspace, the image jumps to a corner with most of it out of view. It should be centered. That's a good question. I'm not quite sure. I don't know if I've experienced that myself. Um, I'll take a look at that afterwards. And um, I know if you're working on an artboard, for some reason, it behaves a little bit differently. But if you're working on a document, um, I'm not sure, but I'll take a look at that afterwards. So we've gone ahead and clipped this. And if we go, you know, hide it and show it, we have a little bit more something, right? Burning and dodging is very, um, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You got to be very careful with it to not over burn, burn and dodge. But there we go. Now, one more thing you might want to consider is you might want to add maybe another layer style. So if I double click on here, I can add an inner shadow. Now you're probably wondering what, what is happening here right now, right? And you might want maybe a very subtle highlight on the left-hand side of the subject. So what I can do is I'm going to switch this back over to that contour there. And maybe I want it on the left-hand side. So I'm going to change the lighting to swivel this over to 180, just like that, right? And I might want to move this in a little bit. I can experiment with the different blend modes, maybe something like soft light to keep it very subtle, right? And you can kind of see we have a nice inner shadow, which in this case is a highlight on the left-hand side, which is kind of cool. And as of a bunch of years ago, you can now add multiple layer styles. So if I wanted maybe a, an actual shadow on the right-hand side, I can press the plus button over here to the right. I can change this to a darker color, swivel this angle over to zero. And now I have a darker shadow on the right-hand side, right? So I can turn off preview on, and that looks pretty cool just adds a little bit of something over to the left and the right. All right, 
So that's looking pretty good. So we have our athlete in the center, and now we want to start really adding some text. And that's kind of where the magazine cover is really gonna to start to come into play. And the first thing we might want is the nice title at the top. So I'm gonna go ahead and group these two objects here, athlete, and then maybe right below. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna make it on top and then we're gonna move it below just so I can show you how that works. But over to the left-hand side in your tools or shortcut key T, we have our text tool right over here. And of course, at the top on the options bar, you can fully control the typeface, the weight, the size, all that fun stuff. Maybe I'll bump up the size just so we can see it because we are working on a 300 PPI document. So 12, it's gonna be incredibly tiny. So I can go ahead and click and type out something like sports, right? And you can also use your transform tools, command and control T, and you can make it larger. Maybe I'll go ahead and center this. And we have some text. Now, obviously this is, this is not very exciting, right? So we wanna make a few things. One, we obviously want to change the color of this text so that there's a nice amount of contrast, especially for accessibility, right? So with the text tool active or inside of your properties panel over to the right-hand side, you can change the color. So I'm gonna go ahead and change the color, definitely on the lighter side, but I might wanna introduce a little bit of either brown or orange or yellow or something to that effect, right? Because we have those brownish and you know darker tones on this magazine cover. So I might wanna pull a little bit of that in, but not going too much because if we go too dark, then it's gonna to start to cause some accessibility problems. So maybe somewhere in this range here, of course I can sit and tweak this for days and that looks okay. But we have our typeface currently set to Helvetica. Helvetica is fine, right? Um, but we want something a little bit more luxurious, a little bit more stylistic. So in this case, I'm gonna pop open my character picker and maybe something like lust could be interesting, right? So we have lust, regular lust display. Again, this was grabbed from Adobe fonts, which I showed you a little bit earlier. And this looks kind of fun, right? And then if you didn't need to alter your text even more, inside of the properties panel, you can do that, right? If you scroll down a little bit, you have your type options. Right now I have it set to small caps. So if I turn that off, we're gonna have, you know, essentially title case or whatever you type, right? And then you have, you know, your all your different options for subscript, superscript, all that fun stuff, caps. But I think for this, sub caps could look pretty decent. Carol's saying, no transforming for you. I'm not sure if that was in reference to my, uh, text transforming, which isn't the best way to transform text because as you can see at the top, 173.3 points, not great, right? Definitely go with, you know, something like 175 or something a little bit more even or odd or whatever. So I'm gonna go ahead and move this here. And that looks okay, right? But it's kind of blocking our main subject. Papyrus is always a good font, I agree. Um, so it's blocking our main subject. So right here inside of the layers panel, what we can do is we can move this just by dragging it right down below. You can also drag it into a group if you hover over top of it, but we're gonna drag it right below and there it is. You can also use the command or control right square bracket keys, right and left square bracket keys to move it up or down. And that looks pretty cool. Now you have, obviously you have to keep in mind that depending on what your magazine title says, some people might not be able to read this, right? So you might wanna maybe move the athlete down a little bit, right? Just so some more of that text is displayed, something like that. But if you have a very notable brand like Sports Illustrated, for example, people will just know what that says. So they can probably cover up 90% of the text back there and people will know that says Sports Illustrated, right? Um, so definitely keep that in mind. Now at the top here, we do have this text set to small caps. And I did that purposely so that I can add in some additional, like additional headline right up here. So if I go ahead and grab my text tool one more time and click, I can type out something like celebrating black history month, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and drop this down quite a bit. And I might wanna change up the text because if you notice, you know, when the, when I have this large headline that says sports and it's nice and large, in this case, it was like 175 points, right? It's pretty legible. 
we can read it, everything looks good. But as you make these display and stylistic typefaces smaller and smaller and smaller, they become a lot harder to read. So in this case, we're gonna switch over to another typeface that I have listed in the starter file, Condor Black, also from uh, Adobe Fonts. So I'm gonna switch over here, make sure I have that type layer selected and type out Condor. And I love in Photoshop, it displays on the right-hand side, a bit of a preview of what that typeface looks like, which is wonderful. There we go. That looks pretty good. But of course, it doesn't really fill out this section, right? So there's a few things that we can do. One, I'm gonna maybe change over to all caps. Maybe I will left align it just like that, right? And that's starting to fill things out a little bit, but it's also looking a little bit squishy. So still within the properties panel, you can control all sorts of things from your text, tracking and spacing and all that stuff. So I can just go ahead and scrub this. And there we go, right? And that fills out a little bit more. I can maybe bump this up just a touch, maybe like 242, very specific, right? No, maybe 245. I just wanna make sure that it lines up. And of course, this is where rulers really comes into play. You can drag out a ruler like that, drag out a ruler on this side to really make sure that things line up. You can hold down your control key to ignore snapping. And that's pretty close, right? 246, almost, <laughs> 247. All right, good enough. Now, one more thing I might wanna incorporate into this particular headline that we just added maybe some additional colors, right? So maybe for you know the Black History Month wording, we might want to add in the Black History Month colors, right? So if I double click on this text layer, I can select all the text, but I can also select the individual words, right? Just by clicking and dragging. And when I have those selected, I can then open up the color picker for my text and make some changes. So in this case, it might be you know, this reddish orange, over here, keeping in mind that the, the background is very dark. So we don't want something too dark, right? So we wanna keep it a little bit lighter. And also if you're working with a darker background, I've talked about this uh, well in the past, is you typically don't wanna use very vibrant colors against a darker background. They just become a little bit of an eyesore. So just you know, bring out some of the saturation a little bit. There we go. And I can select history. And maybe we'll do something similar, but maybe a little bit more on the yellowish side, something like that. And then month, we might wanna do maybe on the greenish side. Now this one, we might have to drop the color a little bit, right? Something in this range here, because the bright green is just throwing everything off. Something like that. Probably would tweak it a little bit more, but that's looking pretty good. All right, so we have some text. I'm gonna go ahead and group these two layers inside of my layers panel and call this header. And there we go. And I might be able to move this up a little bit depending again, like I mentioned earlier on the bleed and things like that, right? Perfect, okay. So we have our header and now if you're familiar with magazines or if you go to Google and search like Sports Illustrator, all sorts of magazine covers, they have text all over the place to kind of highlight what stories they're covering. So we might want, maybe in this area here, a very quick headline about maybe eight ways to stay fit. So we're gonna start with maybe the number eight. We're gonna make it nice and large, and we're gonna type eight. Make that big. Now we do have the Condor Black typeface selected, which I think could work really well. But of course, this particular color is just not gonna work well. We want these particular headlines to really catch people's attention. Because you have to remember that, you know, many of these magazines are in store shelves. They're at checkout lines. And they really want to grab your attention so you just say, eh, fine, I'll buy this because that, whatever this headline is, sounds pretty enticing. So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna change this particular color to something nice and bright. So something in this range here. And this, might start to define your colors, right? Now, of course, if you're, depending on how you're working, who you're working with, you might define your colors before you even start designing the magazine, right? But I'm gonna go ahead and do something like this. 
that looks pretty good right there. And now that I have this color defined, what I probably would start to do if I was designing this for an actual client is start to set up a library. And I'd probably do this beforehand too. But if I hop over to my libraries panel, if you don't see it, if you hop over to your window menu and then down to libraries, you can find your libraries, right? And you can put it anywhere you want. You can dock it, undock it, whatever. And if I go back to all my libraries, I can create a new library and I can call this, let's say, sports magazine. <laughs> magazine, there we go. That's a bit better. Create. And now I can start adding in my colors, my character styles, all sorts of fun things. So I have this particular eight selected. I can go ahead and press the plus button at the bottom and I can add in my text color, my foreground color if I want to, character style, graphic, or all of it. Now in this case, I don't want all of it. So I'm gonna add my text color and my character style, right? And I can very easily double click on this to, I can primary color, right? And I can do the same for this as well. Header highlight. There we go. So I've got my number eight looking pretty snazzy. Pop it right about maybe there. Might be a bit too big to be honest. But we'll see. We'll play around with it. All right. Now beside this, we might want to highlight some additional aspects of this particular header. So I'm gonna go ahead and click, uh, press T on my keyboard, click, well, that's very large. And maybe I'll just do something like ways two. Now, there's, there's, there's a lot going on here. Let me move it above athlete. There's a lot going on, right? So we definitely wanna to go to our properties and we wanna make some changes. Now I'm gonna change this over, I'm gonna change the typeface. Let's keep it a condor just for a second. But I'm going to make sure to set the uh, line height to auto. Maybe I'll left align it like that. Definitely want to make this smaller. And we probably don't want yellow again, right? Because if you have too much yellow, it's just going to be a little bit too distracting. So we're going to switch this over to a simple white, or we can also sample this color here if we wanted to as well. Now, this typeface isn't bad, but I think for body copy, even though it's kind of gonna be nice and bold, I think we're gonna switch it up a little bit. So I'm gonna do something like Proxima Nova. And again, typically on a design like this, you probably wouldn't use this many typefaces, but we're just having some fun showing you different ways to do this. So let's go for something like Proxima Nova Black, which is nice. And I might want to reduce the tracking. So maybe let's try zero again. Maybe I'll drop this down in size a little bit. That looks pretty good. Maybe I'll drop the line height just a touch. Well, let's go a little bit more than that. That could work, right? It's not perfect, but I think it could work. And then I might want one more stay fit, something like that, right? And that might line up with the eight on the left. And I might want this to kind of line up with the S. So I might want to drag out another ruler and make this larger, something like that. Whoops, what did I just do? There we go, close enough, right? Again, not perfect, but little tweaking could probably get us almost all the way there. Now, one more thing we might want to introduce is a page number because someone might be in the checkout line and they might want to take a quick glance at this particular article, right? Eight ways to say fit. So we want to highlight what page this particular article is on. So I'm going to zoom on in here and I might want a rectangle maybe in this area here and that's going to house the number, the page number, right? So over back in their tools, we have our shapes. Shortcut key U. I don't know why, but it's shortcut key U. Probably other things were taken. Um, but we have a rectangle, rectangle, ellipse, triangle, polygon, line, and custom shape tool. And again, you can cycle between these with shift U as well. So I'm gonna choose my rectangle. I'm going to hold down my shift key to make sure it's a perfect square. Draw one out. I'm gonna definitely want my primary color here, but I don't want a border. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the stroke in the properties panel off. So we just have our nice rectangle like this. And on the inside, 
Let's do, let's say page 42. Make this quite a bit smaller. We might want maybe to sample the background color right behind it and pop it somewhere in this range here. I'm gonna make sure to center it. And there we go. So we have our page number right there. Beautiful. I'm gonna group these, call this page, and I'm gonna group these header. Now the one thing I probably can't group with these other elements is the number eight because we use it as a standard text layer and it is behind our subject. Now, of course, if we were to move it on top of our subject, what we can do is we can use a layer mask to knock out our subject, right? If we did want to group it. So what I can do is I can go ahead and open up the group containing the athlete. I can hold down my command or control key Command on the Mac, Control key on Windows, and click on the layer mask. That's gonna select the subject inside of that layer mask. And then with that number eight selected, if I were to simply press on the layer mask, it's going to hide everything outside that selection, which is obviously not what I want, right? So instead, I'm gonna hold down my Alter Option key, Option on the Mac, Alt on Windows, and then click on the layer mask icon, and it's gonna do the opposite. So that way I can go ahead if I wanted to and move all these elements into this one folder, right? So a lot of different ways you can go about doing this, right? Maybe I'll name this body header. All right, that looks pretty good. So now what you might want is maybe down at the bottom, we might want one large headline. I think I just destroyed my microphone. Sorry about that. We might want one large headline that might be the main headline for this magazine, right? So let's go ahead and click and maybe we'll type out something like chasing gold. Make it look smaller. And I think we can probably go back to something a little bit more stylistic for this larger headline, right? So let's go back to Lust and love that Photoshop kind of groups your commonly used or your recently used typefaces right here at the top, which is wonderful. So Lust regular could be good. Make sure it's center. And maybe I'll switch this over to small caps, just like that. Make it quite a bit bigger. And that's looking okay, but I might wanna tweak this a little bit. Maybe drop the, let's try dropping this back to zero. Again, looking okay. There are obviously some issues, right? I'm gonna make sure to center this. There's some issues, right? It's a little bit difficult to read. I like the idea that gold is kind of like this gold color or yellowish color. See, this is why I can't spell while I'm, thank you, Sean. Chasing, there we go, beautiful. All right, now that I've corrected my spelling mistake, um, I'd like the idea that the gold the word gold is kind of yellowish gold, right? But I might want to change this to our whitish yellow up here. And that looks a little bit better, but it's still a little bit difficult to read, right? Because there are some lighter elements behind this text that are kind of clashing a little bit. So one thing we can do is we can put a little bit of a gradient down here at the bottom so that there's a little bit more contrast. So underneath, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a new layer, boop, just like that. I'm gonna call this gradient. Great, I still can't spell, gradient, there we go. And then I'm gonna grab my gradient tool over here to the left-hand side. And instead of going from foreground to background like we did earlier, we want foreground to transparent. Now, of course, we probably don't want the current color that we have, because if we do this, First of all, it's on radial, we don't want that. Um, and also that, that color is just not gonna help with anything, right? So we're gonna switch this over to linear and for the color, we can switch this over to black. Now, you might be wondering, how did I do that? I didn't even click on it. If you press the D key on your keyboard, it's going to reset your colors, black and white. And then you can cycle between them Viola is saying, wow, taking time to name them layers. I try, especially when I'm streaming, I try, because it's a very good practice. Because um, you can search through your layers and all that stuff, but um, you know, it helps. So now, 
and I have black for the foreground, I can go ahead and drag one up again, holding down my shift key. And there we go. And now, just like that, we have a lot more contrast behind that text, which just makes it so much easier to read, especially if we go ahead and right below, add an additional line of text, right? So if I grab my text tool one more time, I could of course click to create another text layer. Or what I can do is I can click and drag, oops, I can click and drag to define a text area, right? And now I can go ahead and let's say, Marcus, where's my text? Where did it go? Let's reset, whoops, let's reset that to auto, color is white. I lost my text, that's fun. That's a bit better. Oh, everything was like squished and stuff. I see, okay. Let's switch this over to maybe Proxima Nova one more time. Maybe bold and auto. There we go. All right, so what was happening is I defined the area and the text was so large and the line height was at zero. There was a lot going on here. Properties panel, definitely hop into the properties panel to um, you know figure all that stuff out, right? Makes a bit larger. There we go. I'm gonna left align it. Obviously the text is way too large. 16, eh, maybe like 18. Let's try that. Set it to white. There we go. So now I can dive in here and I still can't spell. This is not good. Spelling is not great, is it? And I'm cheating a little bit by reading some of the text that I have over here on my other monitor. So don't mind me. A final golden finish. All right, so we have some more text. Now, here's where you probably wanna you know, start talking with your brand team and exploring a few different things, right? Do you want a very simple typeface like Proxima Nova? You probably in this case want to center it, right? Um, do you want it that bold? We can probably drop it down to maybe semi-bold, for example, and that looks pretty good. We might want to also change the color to match our lighter color. Right, so there's a lot of different things you can experiment with. Maybe you want a little bit more of a line height. Maybe 30, possibly. Not bad, right? Or we can try something like, I think Lust is going to be a little bit too difficult to read. Yep, yeah, way too difficult to read. Condor. Yeah, probably also too difficult. And do you want it all caps? Or do you want small caps? Or, you know, regular? A lot of different considerations, especially when you're dealing with body copy that's a lot smaller, you know, fun times, right? But I think that's looking pretty good for the most part. It's not looking great, but I think it'll work for now. I think the line height might be a little bit too much. Let's try something like 24. That could work. I don't love it, but it's going to work, right? Bottom header. Perfect. And then finally, we might want, you know, one more header over here to the left hand side. And what we can do is we can actually grab this body header here, hold down your alter option key and view, drag it on over, right? Maybe we don't want the eight, we can delete that. And maybe we want just something simple like Olympic dreams, something like that, right? Maybe we don't need this. Pop this over here. There's a little bit of accessibility issues going on. It's blending a little bit too much with the background, but I'm gonna grab the page number, move that on over. Double click in here. Maybe this is page 18, for example, and there we go. So I've gone ahead and designed a pretty decent looking magazine cover in you know about 45, 50 minutes or so. Definitely things that we need to change, right? Again, some of the accessibility issues in this area here, I would definitely pay attention to. Maybe move this up or down or something, some or change the color a little bit to make it a little bit more white. You can put a drop shadow behind it. But one thing you might be wondering is, you know, you've, you've gone ahead and designed this, right? But you wanna share it with people to get some feedback. And that's where this big blue button at the top, it comes into play. 
share for a review. Now, I know what you're thinking. I don't like the big blue button. Fine. Under the under your settings, if you go to workspace, interface, that's where I want. If you go to your interface preferences, you can turn on neutral color mode, which essentially changes that to more of a, you know, neutral color. But you can go ahead and share this document. You can invite people to edit or you can share for review so that, you know, your stakeholders, your clients or whoever might be can take a look at it. They can pin areas. They can give you comments. You'll get notified when those comments come on in and you can make changes. So it's a nice, you know, collaborative process. Save and yes, save Carol. That's a, it's a very good idea. That's one reason I usually work on cloud documents. Just saves it by itself, right? But yes, save your work. Thankfully, Photoshop does have auto recovery. So, um, you know, if something does happen, if it crashes, it'll pop it back up. But yeah, save your work, share for review, all that fun stuff. So I hope you all enjoyed this boot camp. Definitely tweet me your results. I'd love to see it. Have some fun with it. Use different subjects, use different headlines, all sorts of fun stuff. Tweet me at Pinsky. I'd love to see all that stuff. You can also share it in our Photoshop Discord. I'm in there from time to time as well. I will be back tomorrow. We're going to be taking a look at photo composition in Photoshop, which is always a lot of fun. Thanks again, everyone, and I'll see you all next time.